Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamansing. A trade war in the middle of a pandemic. We will not escalate and we will not back down. Canada's Deputy Prime Minister is promising dollar-for-dollar dollar retaliation against a new U.S. tariff on Canadian aluminum. And she's not the only one angry. Who does this? In times like this, who tries to go after your closest ally? Ammonium nitrate caused the devastating blast in Beirut. So, are there big stockpiles here? We've got to follow the rules and we mustn't become complacent. How and where the volatile chemical is stored in Canada? Most of the passengers aboard this plane survived the latest on the deadly crash in India. And isolation, depression, and anxiety. Our doctors are in to talk about the pandemic and mental health. This is The National. Frustration on full display in Ottawa as the Deputy Prime Minister outlined how Canada will hit back against the U.S. after Donald Trump reimposed tariffs on some Canadian aluminum. Christopher Freeland is vowing dollar for dollar retaliation and warning that Americans will suffer most. Trump first brought in the tariffs in 2018 but removed them last year. Some U.S. companies complain Canada was flooding the market. Canadian producers say... That's not true. And many believe this is simply political. As Tom Perry shows us the message from Canada, this is not the time. Let me start by saying how much I regret that Canada is once again dealing with a U.S. trade action. Christia Freeland thought her fight with Donald Trump over trade was settled. Instead, the deputy prime minister finds herself back in the ring for round two. We will not escalate, and we will not back down. Freeland calling Trump's decision to reimpose a 10% levy on Canadian aluminum ludicrous and absurd, announcing retaliation, $3.6 billion in tariffs on U.S. goods that contain aluminum. The potential targets, everything from washing machines to bike wheels to golf clubs. Reimposing aluminum tariffs on Canada. Canada was taking advantage of us, as usual. For Donald Trump, the hope appears to be that tough talk on trade will bolster his own hopes for re-election. But it's a risky strategy. I just don't think there's a lot of appetite here uh, by voters on the ground to take more tariff pain, particularly at a time where the economy is very fragile right now. The U.S. president reopening a trade dispute as the economies of both Canada and the U.S. are still struggling in a global pandemic. And who, who does this? In times like this, who tries to go after your closest ally, your closest trading partner, your number one customer in the entire world? Who would do this? Well, President Trump did this. Ontario's premier today urging consumers and companies in his province to fight back to buy Canadian goods over ones produced in the U.S. whenever they can. We we're up against a real battle right now. It's us versus them. The U.S. tariffs don't kick in until later this month. Canada is taking 30 days to finalize its plans for retaliation. Christia Freeland says she still hopes the U.S. may reverse course, but she says with the Trump administration, she's learned to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Tom Perry, CBC News, Ottawa. From talk of retaliation on one issue to reticence from Ottawa on another. In battle, Governor General Julie Payette is facing tough scrutiny over two controversies. And support for her from the Trudeau government is proving hard to find. Ashley Burke, who broke the recent stories on Payette, explains why. It was hardly a ringing endorsement. The Deputy Prime Minister given two opportunities to support Governor General Julie Payette. Should Canadians have confidence in this Governor General? Does your government have confidence in her? And twice she drew a sharp distinction between the office and its occupant, staying silent on praise for Payette. I think Canadians have a great respect for the office of the Governor General, and I have that respect as well. But for this Governor General? 
as I said, uh, I think Canadians understand and appreciate the way our system of government, our constitutional system works. The Governor General, the office of the Governor General plays a very important role in that system. It's the clearest signal so far that the Liberal government is distancing itself from the Governor General Justin Trudeau selected in 2017. And I know she will do uh, an extraordinary job. But three years into the job, she's come under fire for creating a toxic work environment, claims she's harassed employees, and Trudeau hasn't directly come to her defense. Every Canadian has the right to a safe, secure workspace free from uh, harassment. And now revelations a quarter of a million dollars was spent on projects to fulfill Payette's own desire for privacy at Rideau Hall. When we spend money, we are spending the money of Canadians, and we have to be very, very thoughtful about that, very careful about that. Well, at this stage right now, an office which is supposed to be above partisanship, is supposed to be above controversy, is supposed to represent Canadians as a whole, is finding itself having to, to dodge and weave and explain various things that really don't make it out to be the dignified office that it's supposed to be. Lagasse says it falls to the Prime Minister to address this controversy, one in which he says is causing damage to the integrity of one of the highest offices in the country. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. Tomorrow marks another milestone in the deadly fight against COVID-19. It will be 150 days since the World Health Organization declared a pandemic. And the United States heads into the weekend rapidly closing in on a grim total once thought unimaginable. Almost 5 million cases. Deaths now topping 160,000. Today is also the 11th straight day the virus has claimed at least 1,000 lives. A Canadian man is among those lost to the virus in the U.S. in recent days, a victim of a major outbreak at an immigration detention centre. Tonight, his devastated family is speaking out, claiming his death could have been avoided. Ellen Morrow now on who they want held accountable. OK, come on in. This is my Uncle Jim's room, or what would have been his room. Jessica Morostaga set up this room for James Hill, an uncle, she says, who was like a father. This is the last picture I have of my uncle. It was during our wedding. Family photos, a closet full of clothes, even a Father's Day card waiting for him. But Hill will never see any of it. It is hard to come in. I haven't been able to take anything down yet. Hill died of COVID-19 this week while in custody of U.S. Immigration Enforcement. He was awaiting deportation to Canada that was originally scheduled for the beginning of July, but then he got sick. We were all, as a family, looking forward to him coming home and embracing him. Hill had been held at this immigration detention facility in Farmville, Virginia, since April, just waiting for his flight home after serving a prison term in Louisiana. Nearly every single detainee at Farmville has contracted COVID-19. High risk at 72 years old, Hill was scared every day, says his family. My uncle said it's not a matter of, of if I get COVID, it's, it's when. Before and after he fell ill, Hill's family says they contacted Canadian officials asking for help to bring him home sooner. I go to the consulate and say, you know, why didn't you advocate a little bit harder? Who do you hold accountable for the fact that this has happened? In my heart, I would say it's the Canadian Embassy. I would say they didn't do their job. To be honest, I felt like they were a messenger. I felt like they just simply passed a message back and forth, but there was no, no advocacy, no, no saying to the, you know, ICE, this isn't okay. In a statement, Global Affairs offered sincere condolences, but citing privacy did not respond to the family's criticism. To have them leave this world like that was, is, is a tragedy. A tragedy only just beginning to sink in. Memories, the only comfort for Hill's family. He used to give great big bear hugs. Um, you know, you could talk to him about things. He was reassuring and um, he had to always say, remember, I love you. So just, just those little things, but they would have meant a lot. Ellen Morrow, CBC News, Guelph, Ontario. Here in Canada, the number of COVID-19 deaths has moved beyond 9,000 with four new deaths recorded today. The total stands at 9,008, Quebec accounting for well over half of that toll. But today, Alberta led the country in newly reported cases, followed by Quebec and Ontario. Ten cases of COVID-19 have now been confirmed among workers at meat processing plant in Manitoba. The union says its members are afraid to go to work, but both the company and the province say the spread is happening in the community, not at the plant. 
Vancouver's police union says three of its members have tested positive for the virus and two other patrol teams are now in isolation after responding to an out-of-control party in the city. More than 100 people had reportedly gathered by the time police got involved. New numbers show another month of job gains after the worst of the losses from coronavirus lockdowns. More than 419,000 jobs were added in July, about 80% were part-time, and Canada is still down 1.3 million jobs compared to February before the shutdown. The jobless rate dropped to 10.9%, but it's higher for some minority communities. This was the first time the StatsCan Employment Survey has provided race-based data. Even as jobs return, researchers warn of a looming problem. Jacqueline Hansen shows us how the pandemic takes a toll on mental health for people unemployed, but also those still working. Coming together to connect and open up. I think coming from an Asian cultural background, you don't typically talk about mental health that often. But the pandemic has changed so much. My job has just kind of disappeared. This Pilates and fitness instructor does some teaching online, but the money isn't nearly the same. The financial stress has been pretty difficult. Just yesterday, this social media manager was laid off from a part-time job for the second time. So to kind of lose that out of nowhere, thinking that you have that security, it is a roller coaster. Even having a job comes with new pressures, especially when you work for a group of local businesses struggling with the pandemic. You're seeing all these businesses become devastated, not know what to do, coming to you for answers, calling you at all hours of the day. Talking about the stress of it all with family, friends and professionals, even taking medication can be crucial. Those are the things like that I need more of right now because of all this unpredicted change. This analyst created economic models to understand how widespread the need for mental health support will be. We're speaking three times more visits to a mental health professional per year, 20% uh, more uh, antidepressant uh, prescriptions uh, annually. That's half a million. And it could last for years. It's a time for employers to reach out to their employees and understand how they can provide more flexibility, more options to uh, help their employees, especially women and single moms uh, that are uh, at the forefront of the human impact of COVID-19. This contract worker hopes it's also time to consider universal access to mental health services rather than people like her paying out of pocket. We all need the same type of health help, regardless of what type of work we're doing. Support for the human crisis that the researchers warn is likely coming. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. We have much more on your mental health in the pandemic, including guidance from doctors just ahead. If employment isn't stressful enough right now, whether you're working or not, job-related fraud reports have gone up during the pandemic. As Nicole Ireland tells us, scammers are taking advantage of job seekers. They said that they had they had seen my resume um, on Indeed. When 25-year-old Ashley got a job offer in June from a company called Gux IT, she was excited but cautious. She went over the website thoroughly to make sure the company was legitimate, including its Vancouver address. Um, everything that you're basically told to look for red flags, uh, they had pretty much covered. <laughs> CBC News has agreed to use Ashley's first name only. She's scared because her new employers turned out to be fraudsters. A fake manager told Ashley she needed to convert a $2,000 e-transfer into Ethereum or Ether, similar to Bitcoin, to buy software and web domain names for clients. Moments after Ashley followed instructions to use this cryptocurrency ATM, she got a call from someone in Vancouver she'd asked to check out Guxit's office address. He's like... Uh, this company doesn't exist. It's nowhere in the building. And my heart and my stomach just sank. CBC News investigated and found the Gux IT website Ashley had so carefully checked was stolen from a company in Ukraine. Gux IT copied everything from employee photos to the company's history almost verbatim. What we see is the fraud just take time to set up fraudulent websites uh, that may spoof real companies or, or seem legitimate. 
The number of job-related scams reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre so far in 2020 is approaching the more than 2,400 reports for all of 2019. Many are money laundering schemes designed to get unsuspecting new hires to take dirty money through e-transfers and convert it to cryptocurrency that's much harder to trace. Ashley hopes by speaking out, she can prevent this kind of scam from happening to someone else. Nicole Ireland, CBC News, Toronto. Saskatchewan is investing in a protective measure against COVID-19 for when schools reopen next month. The initial order of 6 million masks will be delivered and distributed to school divisions before the start of the school year. But the province says wearing those masks will not be mandatory. About 100 people gathered today to press for better safety protocols. A similar conflict is playing out in Canada's largest province. Deanna Sumanak johnson shows us that. It was a pop quiz day for Ontario's Premier Doug Ford, but there was only one question. Will you commit to revisiting your plan on smaller class sizes right now, yes or no? Are you open to smaller class sizes? They say that classes should be smaller than usual. We're flexible. We have to be flexible. We have to be adaptable. And my number one concern is to protect the children. For a solid week, parent groups have petitioned the province to lower class sizes. They may now have a new ally. In a letter written to the Toronto District School Board, the city's public health agency flagged some issues with the reopening plan. The number of students in the classroom should be smaller than the usual class sizes and there should be more room to maintain physical distancing. I hope that this is a sign of a, a, a momentum uh, in opinion. This mother of three welcomes the support. Parents need to feel their fear is justified and validated, and that's what the Toronto Public Health uh, response did. It made us feel like, yes, this is a real concern. Come up with a number that we can do together. The province allocated $30 million for the hiring of new teachers across Ontario. Toronto District School Board says that won't be nearly enough for its needs alone. If the TDSB was to go to cohorts of 15 in elementary schools, uh, it would cost us about $250 million. That's exactly. what it would cost in because for additional teachers. The Public Health Agency of Canada released its own guidelines today. Masks on children over the age of 10, physical distancing and smaller class sizes where possible, though no specific class size is given. The pressure on provinces to relieve at least some of the fears will grow as September approaches. Deanna Sumanak johnson CBC News, Toronto. RCMP documents obtained by CBC show the man arrested for breaking into Rideau Hall last month was carrying more than 400 rounds of ammunition. Corey Hurin faces 22 criminal charges after allegedly ramming the gates on July 2nd. The documents show the bullets were for the prohibited semi-automatic rifle he carried, capable of penetrating standard bulletproof vests. DeFonte Miller and his lawyers slammed Toronto police today, saying an apology does nothing to build bridges. The, the publicity stunt that occurred yesterday, well, that's a perfect example of disrespectful relationships making it worse. Police apologized for how they handled the 2016 beating of Miller by an off-duty officer. It left him blind in one eye. A review showed the province's police watchdog should have been notified right away. At least four departments on Prince Edward Island are working to contain a forest fire in the eastern part of the province. No homes are being evacuated right now, but the situation is being closely monitored. They were almost back home in India after being stranded by the pandemic, but 17 people were killed and dozens injured when their plane skidded off a runway in heavy rain. Thomas Dagla has the details. A frantic rescue effort at a dreadful scene. That's a Boeing 737 broken in half after overshooting the runway and skidding down that embankment about 10 meters with nearly 200 people on board. The aircraft, the front portion has been very badly mangled and damaged. The Air India flight had come from Dubai to bring home people stranded by the pandemic. Instead, victims were rushed to hospital, some so young they were carried in. The injured, dozens of them, kept coming through the night. Something didn't happen properly. Possibly the pilot touched down too far down the runway. Perhaps the wind suddenly shifted at the last minute. Remember, it's monsoon season in India. Earlier in the day, in the same southern state, Kerala, 
torrential rain triggered a deadly landslide. Facing harsh conditions in the evening, the pilot made a first attempt at the runway, turned around and tried again for a botched landing. This is the kind of accident that technology is not there to prevent. And I'll tell you, it's, it's going to happen again. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi tweeted he's pained by the accident and said his thoughts are with those who lost loved ones. <laughs> Investigators will attempt to recover the flight data and cockpit voice recorders to better understand what happened. For families who agonized over loved ones stuck abroad, there's now grief amid the agony. Thomas Dagler, CBC News, Toronto. Pain is given way to protest in Lebanon. This is our only chance to do. We should stick together. We should rise again together. We should do the revolution. Up next, as the government points fingers about that deadly explosion, Lebanese people call for action. Plus, the pandemic and your mental health. Advice from our doctors after you flooded our inbox with questions. And the hottest ticket in town. I woke up, put my oiler gear on, ran downstairs, sat at the computer. How the Edmonton Oilers 50-50 draw broke the internet. We're back in two. Three days after an explosion devastated parts of Beirut, killing more than 150 people, the search for survivors continues. Teams from Turkey and Russia searched through the rubble at the port today where the blast was centered. Dozens of people are still missing. And as Rebecca Collard shows us, those who survived are desperate now for help and for answers. Against her will, this woman is being carried from her home. Rescue workers are worried the building could collapse, but Rose Salim Ulam doesn't want to leave. God is above protecting me, she says. But like so many here, she has no faith in her government to help. Today, as the search continues for what set off Tuesday's blast at Beirut's port, Lebanon's president suggested it could have been deliberate. This could be caused by an accident, caused by negligence or by external interference through a missile or bomb, he said. Hezbollah's leader Hassan Nasrallah said his party is not to blame. I wholeheartedly deny that there is anything that belongs to us in the port, he said. No warehouse for weapons, rockets, no guns, no bombs, no bullets, no nitrate, nothing. In the streets of Beirut, many do not expect the truth from a government they say is corrupt. Judy Safe is among them. They're only going to say lies and lies, and we know that they are lying. So this is our only chance to do. We should stick together. We should rise again together. We should do the revolution and let's hope for the best. Lebanon badly needs help, but like so many here, SAFE has a message for the international community. The aid should come to the hands of the people who uh, got affected from this blast and not to the government. Canada and other countries have made it clear they will work through aid organizations instead. There are thousands of people in the streets of Beirut here helping with this massive cleanup operation. One of them has just handed me this piece of paper. It says this is the last day they're going to be cleaning the streets of Beirut. Tomorrow, they're going to start cleaning the country of corrupt politicians. Almost no one here has any faith in the statements today by their political leadership. They say instead, tomorrow, they're taking to the streets in protest. Rebecca Collard, CBC News, Beirut. That blast in Beirut is blamed on thousands of tons of ammonium nitrate that had been stored for years at the city's port. The chemical is also stored in this country, but as Salima Shibji explains, it's also highly regulated. Along the St. Lawrence River at ports like this one, ammonium nitrate is stored en route to mines in northern Quebec. It stays here a few hours, a few days max, under strict watch, says Maurice Richard, the head of the port. Upriver, there's more, kept near Montreal to make fertilizer used on farms. Maud Roberge lives a few kilometers away with her young family. It scares her, not knowing how much of the chemical compound is housed here, in specialized domes on land rented from the Port of Montreal. There are fewer than 40 similar facilities in the country, all in the east, all federally regulated, with safety protocols shared with local emergency crews. 
there is security around those facilities. The product is inspected regularly. It has to be of the highest quality. It's, and they would not hold on to the product over a year. It's moved uh, quickly. Uh, it has uh, to be. To avoid disaster, when ammonium nitrate sits, it gets more dangerous. It's a chemical used so commonly for so many years that some experts say it's easy to forget just how unstable it can be. It is really quite dangerous, and therefore we've got to follow the rules and we mustn't become complacent. For this professor, that's one of the main lessons to be learned from the deadly explosion in Beirut. Oversight over hazardous substances is one of those pieces of the bureaucracy that can be cut. But we have a system in place in order to track registration and to ensure that people handling it know how to handle it. And that system is not above review. Every country around the world is going to be looking at what may have happened in Beirut and, and ensuring that we've got appropriate precautions in place. To make sure hazardous chemicals are always kept strictly in check. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Ottawa. Next on The National, the pandemic and your mental health. We opened our inbox and you flooded it with questions and issues. From ways to live with worry to guiding your kids through unsettling times. Our doctors are next. What used to be routine, what was it, four or five months ago, going to work or school, seeing friends, even grocery shopping, has changed so much during this pandemic. And add to that, for almost everybody, some level of financial stress. Well, today, the health minister, Patty Haidu, expressed huge concern for the mental health of Canadians. So while physical distancing and masks can help stop the spread of the virus, or at least slow it down, what can we do to take care of our mental health? Well, with some guidance tonight is uh, Dr. Shumi Kang, a psychiatrist and author based here in Vancouver, and Dr. Thomas Unger, psychiatrist-in-chief at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. We got a lot of questions. We were actually overwhelmed by the, the number and depth of them. And Dr. Kang, let me put the first one to you. Our daughters are nervous about going back to school. They ask me, why is it okay they go into a school building in September, but Dad doesn't have to go back to his office downtown? I don't know how to reassure them. Uh, Dr. Kang, what would you suggest? Well, these, that's a very good, curious question, smart kids. Um, I would say that, first of all, we want to be truthful, optimistic, and make sure we reassure students and children that the adults are planning and in control because children experience anxiety more. Um, let them know that there are protocols between public health and school officials, but remind them that they may not be perfect, that they have a voice to express any concern or caution, and to work collaboratively with their teachers, administrators, and most of all, their parents and caregivers that you will be them, be there to help guide them, and with a tone of optimism. This is a stressful time for everyone, especially young people. But Dr. Kang, you deal with children all the time here in Vancouver and as an author as well. And I guess one of the challenges, and I saw this last night on The National, with some parents who, right or wrong, don't have confidence in the back-to-school plan. So how do they deal with their children when they themselves are anxious? Right. And I think so being truthful is totally fine. Children can sense if you are concerned. And so you don't want to lie. So if you do have concerns, express exactly what they are. Um, don't give them a laundry list of things that they can't do anything about. And then quickly turn to practical solutions. Say, you know, what? I'm not quite sure social distancing has been figured out. This is what I would like you to do. I'm going to give you this noodle and you can measure uh, your space or let's practice the mask or hand washing. So be very specific and practical at this point with young people and try not to overwhelm them with your own individual concerns. Dr. Unger, next question to you. I think twice about leaving home and going out in public and I'm on edge whenever I'm out in public places. I've certainly heard people say things like that. You probably have too. What's your advice? Yeah, so this is a weird time. If you're not worried, there's something wrong with you. So you got to validate it's normal to be anxious and worried. It's based on reality. There's nothing unusual about that, but that doesn't make it an illness or anything. It just means we have to acknowledge that, accept that. Uh, and then to hide out and have the anxiety overwhelm you and paralyze you, if we're now allowed out and we're being increasingly allowed to go out and start doing things, it means it's time to begin dipping your toe in the shallow end and gradually moving on and getting used to a manageable amount of anxiety. And it'll get a little better, you know. It's really scary at the beginning, but you 
You go with your comfort level, you start exposing yourself, because we have to learn to live with uh, the anxiety and to live with the reality in as safe as possible a way as we can. So I would just acknowledge it, validate it, but then encourage them to begin starting to gradually get out there to the degree that they can comfortably do it, because it'll get a little bit better and better as they gradually expose themselves over time. And Dr. Unger, let me put the next question to you as well. The, the pandemic has been absolutely horrible. I was raised to be a good hard worker. Having my job taken away from me has caused endless amounts of anxiety. I want my job back. Yeah, so that, I really feel for people like that. I mean, this really sucks. It's got significant potential economic impacts and work impacts for a lot of people. Um, and that's just a real harsh reality. So uh, I understand how upset they'll be down and sad. Um, if you're really negative and really feeling down and nothing gets you out of it, then I think you need to go get checked out. Contact your health provider, family doctor, mental health hotline, because there's a slight chance that that regular down that you're supposed to feel because of the difficulty can actually slide into a, a mental health or medical condition we call depression. So if you're too despaired, please get checked out. And Dr. Kang, uh, we have about 30 seconds left, but kind of on that theme for those people who just are feeling, maybe it's not even overwhelming anxiety, but just, just nervous about getting into any kind of routine at all, your, your word to them? I would agree with Dr. Unger. I think that there is this concept of pandemic fatigue, like a precursor to mental health symptoms. They're characterized by sleep disturbance, irritability, anxiety, a feeling of loneliness. Be careful, uh, be watchful for those. And basic self-care, routine regular sleep, routine regular movement, exercise, and social connection. It's not socializing, but social bonding. Be very aware we need to flatten the mental health curve uh, and really help Canadians get through this difficult time. I don't say this glibly. It actually is comforting hearing from both of you. And we, we, you know, there are lots of questions we didn't get to. So hopefully we can do this again. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure. And thanks to all of you who shared your experiences with us, either by email or on social media. Obviously, we couldn't get to many of them, much less all of them. But we do appreciate being part of the conversation on mental health. And if you or someone you know needs support, you can call or text Crisis Services Canada. Here's the number, one 833 Four five six four five six six, and kids help phone at one eight hundred six six eight six eight six eight. You can also, of course, search online. People are available around the clock. There are now more than 9,000 COVID-19 related deaths in Canada, and we've been taking you through the stories behind the numbers in a special project called Lives Remembered. Tonight, Len Newton is remembered by his nephew. My name is Tony Zanetta. I am Len Newton's nephew. Len passed away on April 23rd, 2020 due to complications from COVID-19. He was days shy of his 98th birthday. He was a veteran of World War II, a Vancouver fireman for 34 years, and 41 years retired with the love of his life, my Aunt Charlotte. My uncle was irreverent, possessed an amazing sense of humor, and ability to tell a story. He was a character larger than life. He was stoic yet sensitive and truly cared about people. He was modest and gentle, yet he possessed the steel of an honest man. He was born in Vancouver in 1922. At 19, he enlisted in the Royal Canadian Navy and was assigned to the HMCS Sudbury as a stoker with his designated battle station on the depth charges. 2019, he returned to Halifax from Vancouver to tour her sister ship, the Sackville, now the Canadian Memorial. He delighted the crew with his stories from back in the day. After surviving the Atlantic convoys, Len was discharged in 46 and joined the Vancouver Fire Department. A man very proud of his chosen profession, he retired with 34 years service at the rank of captain. He lived at home with Charlotte until the end, making children's toys and keeping the garden. He would horrify the neighbors by climbing ladders at age 97 to clean the eaves and to put up the Canadian flag on Dominion Day. He was always very childlike in, in his qualities and his love of life. But he was a man of great dignity, poise, and armed with a sense of humor and a twinkle in his eye that could charm anyone. He was a true Canadian hero, selfless, loved, and respected by all who knew him. And thanks to Tony for sharing that. We've gathered more stories of people lost to COVID-19 on our website. You can find them at cbc.ca slash remembered. When we come back, an election that could unseat the man known as Europe's last remaining dictator. The woman who could win and what's at stake. Plus. Oh, oh, my lock clock just got in. 
The Edmonton Oilers break the internet with their 50-50 draw after the last jackpot hit 2.7 million. Coming up. The United States is imposing sanctions on Hong Kong leader Carrie Lam, along with 10 other top Chinese officials. It comes as tensions continue to escalate between the two powers. Just last night, the U.S. moved to ban transactions with the Chinese owners of the WeChat and TikTok apps. Europe's longest-serving leader is running for a sixth term, but denying COVID-19 has hurt the president of Belarus politically. As Rene Filipponi tells us, the man who has ruled for decades with an iron hand faces an unprecedented challenge from a 37-year-old stay-at-home mom. A political rally of this size is unheard of in Belarus. But in this election, the call for change is getting louder. And it's led by Svetlana Tihanovskaya. I am tired of being patient, she says. I'm tired of being silent. She is a reluctant politician who only put her name on the ballot after her husband, a political blogger who planned to challenge the president, was arrested. I am worried and I'm scared every day, but I have to take my fears, my scares into fist and go ahead. Alexander Lukashenko, often referred to as Europe's last dictator, has been in power for 26 years, but his popularity is waning. The economy of Belarus is struggling, and there are persistent accusations of corruption. Lukashenko has also essentially brushed off the coronavirus as a non-issue. There is no virus here, he said. Do you see them flying around? Refusing to cancel large events, even suggesting vodka and saunas could stop the virus. It showed that actually Belarusians cannot trust on authorities. This political analyst says people are angry, and it's made worse by concerns the election won't be fair. Lukashenko has been accused of rigging elections, using tactics like voter suppression since he came to power. He is expected to declare himself the winner again, and there will likely be protests. They will take place, and for sure police will be very brutal and it will be performatively violent. Activists and journalists have already been rounded up and jailed. But it's not stopping Tianovskaya's supporters. I'm not a fearless person, says this young woman, but I'm afraid more for the rest of my life and my future rather than at this moment. Opposition voters are showing up to polling stations with these white bands, a visual record, proof of who is casting a ballot. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Right after this, it's an annual problem that we're just not prepared for. I have to uproot my family from the home. Like, I couldn't have them live in this environment anymore. Why Canada is still a C student when it comes to flood preparation. Next. Flooding is the costliest natural disaster affecting Canadians. For example, in eastern Canada, last year alone, insurance companies paid out $208 million. And the impact, of course, is beyond financial. The emotional cost has taken a toll on hundreds of thousands of Canadians. A new report says provinces and territories need to move faster to get ahead of flood risk. As Tashana Reid tells us, there's been some improvement from recent years, but not nearly enough. So pretty much the water was up to our waist. It was only 30 minutes of rain, but the damage left behind was too much for this Toronto homeowner. The whole street was filled with uh, black sewage. Backed up sewers forcing dirty water into his and his neighbor's homes. It's the third year in a row he's had flooding, and now he's selling. I had to uproot my family from the home. Like I couldn't have them live in this, in this environment anymore because every year, we don't know how much it's going to escalate. Along rivers, coastlines, and in cities, flooding impacts much of this country. And a new report from the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation explored how prepared Canada is for flood risks. Researchers interviewed 139 government representatives and graded provinces and territories on things like emergency management, flood mapping, and land use planning. Overall, Canada received a C a step up from the C-minus three years earlier. So the good news is we improved a little bit. The bad news is we didn't improve that much. 
Researchers say provinces and territories were strong in areas such as emergency plans, but less so when it came to regulation around development in flood risk zones. Even in areas that we know at are uh, high risk of flooding, we're not always as forceful as we could be in reference to not let, letting people build and develop in those areas. The province that scored the highest across the board was PEI. We have beautiful coastlines, and those areas are just naturally more at risk due to flooding. In recent years, the island has updated its flood maps, installed a storm surge warning system, and introduced two artificial reefs to prevent shoreline flooding. It's a conversation about where do you put infrastructure, what kinds of infrastructure do you place in certain locations so that you can minimize the impact to it in the event of a flood. Researchers say the impacts of climate change means flooding will only get worse, and all provinces and territories need to act now. Tashana Reed, CBC News. Toronto. In Oak Bay near Victoria, British Columbia, the deer population is out of control, causing car crashes and ravaging gardens, just to name a couple of problems. And as we first showed you in October, there's an ongoing program with a first-of-its-kind solution. The deer are being given birth control. Tanya Fletcher explains. This is the face of Oak Bay's deer problem. The picturesque community nestled on the outskirts of Victoria has been taken over by deer. If they get into my backyard, I'm not sure how, but they, they find a way. They've become problematic. They poo on my lawn, they eat my plants. We've been in our house for 24 years. And some residents have had and enough. At first I thought they were adorable and now they are such a pest. But the overpopulation is not a new problem. The deer have been around for years, so in 2015 the municipality launched a trial deer cull didn't go over well. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, I guess, contention around uh, the call at that time. So there's a proposal made that same year to try an immunocontraception. Immunocontraception, also known as animal birth control. I've just been doing a half milliliter. Cutting edge science is now being used in a pilot program to try to prevent the deer from procreating. First, researchers have to figure out exactly how many deer they're dealing with. A control group is identified and those deer are tagged. Okay. Safety's on, there is a dart in the rifle. Dart. The team sets out early in the morning searching for deer on suburban streets. No subtle task in the middle of a small city. Uh, it just is important that we make sure we do things right, that we aren't taking unnecessary risks or unnecessary challenges. Now it's time to look for a doe that's tagged to be targeted for the vaccine. Is there one there that doesn't have a collar? It doesn't take long to spot one. Fawn just came running into the forest here. Son. Next, they lock and load the tranquilizers. And within minutes, their target is brought down the second one of the day. Let's just put her on this side of the tree here. The doe is carried out into the open, and now it's time to inject the vaccine. Where did she get darted? Darted left. Started left, so you want to inject it in the left. The big question, will it work? At this point, researchers are pegging its efficacy at around 70 to 80 percent, and the hope is to expand this pilot program right across the country. If it works, it's really going to be a win-win, and so almost uniformly, people are really strongly on board with what we're doing here. Right now, we can't think of any reasons why it wouldn't work somewhere else. She ready for reversal? Communities throughout Canada are eagerly awaiting the results, or better yet, lack of results of this groundbreaking study. That way, that way. The doe awakens, success for now. Yeah, that a girl. And with the first phase now finished. Oh, there's one there. Researchers are hoping the solution is as obvious. We'll get that one next time. As the problem. Oh, no. Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Oak Bay, BC. Next on the National, Edmonton Oilers fans were almost certainly watching the game tonight, but today, plenty of them spent a lot of time looking at this. The frenzy over the team's multi-million dollar 50-50 draw is our moment. It's weird enough to be watching hockey in August, but Edmonton Oilers fans have been going all in on the experience, hoping not just to be entertained by the games, but to get rich. The team's online 50-50 draw has taken on a life of its own, breaking records and technology as people push for a little pandemic excitement. But getting a ticket is a fight all its own, and tonight, that's our moment. I was like everybody else. I woke up, put my oiler gear on, ran downstairs, dad the computer with the phone and the iPad and everything else and started at 9.
but I don't think anybody's got through. I'm sitting here still watching that little circle go around and around. I started with my phone and it wasn't working. So I grabbed the tablet, started with that, grabbed my laptop. So I even tried my Xbox and it would not connect either. Oh, 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 oh. I just finally got error ID, start a new purchase here. Now I got to start all over again. I would just want to be like, wake up and be debt free and live in a house and not make a payment on anything. I think that at least if I have tickets, I'm not going to hate the person who wins as much. <laughs> at least I tried. <laughs> Good news, good news, bad news. The good news is both of them got tickets, so they have a chance to win. The good news is also that the other half of those 50-50s has gone to the Edmonton Oilers Foundation, which doles out lots of grants to various charities. The bad news, of course, and we won't dwell on it, the Oilers lost tonight. They've been eliminated and so done for these playoffs. That is a national for Friday, August the 7th. Good night. <laughs>